The man known to history as Napoleon Bonaparte was born on the 15th of August, 1769, in the town of Ajaxio, on the Mediterranean island of Corsica. For centuries, this had formed part of the Republic of Genoa, but at the time Napoleon was born, it had just been amalgamated into the Kingdom of France. Napoleon's father was Carlo Bonaparte, a prominent lawyer and politician, who also acted as an aide and close associate of Pasquale Paoli, the leading Corsican nationalist of the second half of the 18th century, and a man who had fought to throw off both Genoese and French rule on the island. As we will see, the Corsican independence movement shaped much of Napoleon's life and political outlook until his mid-twenties. His mother was Maria Letizia Bonaparte, whose maiden name was Ramolino. Like the Bonapartes, the Ramolinos were a family of Italian origin, originally hailing from the Lombardy region of northern Italy. Her father was a minor official and military officer who had commanded the garrison of Ajaxio before his death in the mid-1750s, after which her mother remarried to a Swiss officer serving in the Genoese Navy. Consequently, Napoleon hailed from a family which comprised of prominent Corsican officials and military figures on both sides. Napoleon grew up in Corsica, living in his family's three-story manor house, Casa Bonaparte in Ajaxio. He possibly suffered briefly from a bout of tuberculosis in his youth, which would explain the hacking cough he had for some time, evidence of which was still visible on his left lung a half a century later in the post-mortem carried out after his death. His family nickname for him, Rabolione, meaning troublemaker, indicates a vivacious child. But he was also a prodigious reader, absorbed in histories and biographies from a young age. As he grew up, Alexander the Great, who had conquered the known world as King of Macedon in the 4th century BC, was his idol, closely followed by Julius Caesar. Yet, he was also a child of his time, reading works by his near contemporary, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, the great French Romantic Enlightenment philosopher, long before he became a teenager. Overall, the sense we get is of a relatively happy childhood, though one which would be cut brutally short, long before he was even a teenager, when Napoleon would be sent to the mainland as part of the new policy of Gallicization of Corsica. The country which Corsica had become a part of, right around the time of Napoleon's birth, was one which was mired in the past. While a form of constitutional monarchy had evolved in Britain during the 17th century, after a protracted struggle between the Crown and Parliament, France was an absolutist monarchy, one in which the Bourbon dynasty of kings ruled the country in a totalitarian fashion. The government, such as it was, was comprised of a small group of ministers who were hand-picked by King Louis XIV and his advisers. No parliament had been convened in the country since 1614, and to compound matters, King Louis XIV, the paragon of absolutism in Europe during his long reign between 1643 and 1715, had even moved the court from Paris to his vast palatial estate at Versailles outside the city. Consequently, France in the 18th century was dominated by the king and his government, the aristocracy, the Roman Catholic Church, and a small army of royal bureaucrats who kept hated taxes like the gabelle, the tax on salt, high and helped collect revenue to maintain the splendor of the court and the large armies which France needed to continue its perennial rivalry with Britain. Napoleon's views on two particular subjects were evolving at this time in striking ways which would influence the course of his life. Firstly, despite being raised as a Roman Catholic in line with both the French and Italian traditions of the time, he became a child of the Enlightenment in largely rejecting organized religion as he matured into a young man. Napoleon, in his later years, was evidently an atheist in all but name, though few people in the 18th century consciously defined themselves as such. Instead, his new existential outlook began to prioritize action in the world. This was shaped by his understanding of history. 
As he reported in a letter to the Marquis de Colancourt many years later, the reading of history very soon made me feel that I was capable of achieving as much as the men who were placed in the highest ranks of our annals. Thus, from an early age, Napoleon was conscious that military figures and statesmen had shaped human history through their actions and wished to emulate them. It was lofty ambition for an individual who, although he was born into a powerful enough family on Corsica, essentially hailed from a provincial backwater in European terms and was far from the center of any major political power when he was born in 1769. On the 24th of February, 1785, while Napoleon was studying at the École in Paris, his father died at Montpellier in the south of France, home of one of the world's oldest medical schools, where Carlo had headed to seek help for his declining health. He was just 38 at the time of his death. The cause of his premature demise has never been fully resolved. Clearly, the ailment came from his stomach, and this has led scholars to assume that he was either suffering from stomach cancer or from a severe ulcer which had led to perforation of his stomach, a condition which would explain the acute state of delirium which Joseph Bonaparte reported his father spent his last days in. This was seemingly a hereditary condition, and Napoleon's own premature death over 35 years later would be from related causes. Back in 1785, news of his father's death cut Napoleon to the core. He deeply respected Carlo, despite the fact that he had only seen him twice in the previous six years. His demise might well explain Napoleon's lifelong distrust of doctors, while his premature death saw Napoleon become the spiritual head of the family, vaulting past his older brother Joseph to exercise what his younger brother Louis called the greatest superiority among the Buenapartes. Carlo's death quite possibly also inspired Napoleon's drive in life, with the young Buonaparte adopting the attitude that he needed to make his mark on the world early, for fear that he would not live to be an old man. Just a few short months after Carlo's passing, Napoleon took his final assessment at the École in Paris, his family's declining financial situation having necessitated that Buonaparte condense two years of study into one. Despite this, he passed, becoming the first Corsican to graduate from France's most esteemed military academy. He was quickly commissioned on the 1st of September 1785 as a second lieutenant into the Compagnie d'Autum of Bombardiers within the 1st Battalion of the Régiment de la Fer, one of France's oldest artillery regiments. However, he immediately had to take some leave to attend his family's financial affairs. Carlo Bonaparte, despite his success as a lawyer and latterly as a diplomat, had left his family in financial trouble, primarily owing to a decision to borrow 137,500 francs, a very sizable sum of money at the time, from the government in order to establish a mulberry tree plantation back in Corsica. The business venture failed, and shortly after Carlo's death, the government began seeking repayment of the grant money. It was the beginning of several years in which Napoleon was forced to solicit any official he knew in both Corsica and Paris for relief from the Bonaparte's financial malaise. Relief did not come and legal challenges followed. The result was that the family were facing destitution in the mid to late 1780s and primarily viewed the outbreak of the revolution in 1789 as a boon, because it might result in their debt simply being cancelled or forgiven. Realizing that there would be no quick fix to the Mulberry debacle in 1785, Napoleon took up his position with the Regiment de la Fer in the town of Valence, on the banks of the Rhone, midway between Lyon and Marseille in the late autumn. His life here as a junior officer, who remarkably had only just turned 16 years of age, was Spartan, owing to the family's financial circumstances. His room at Valence had only a bed, an armchair and a table, 
while he was known to impose on the goodwill of local cafes and restaurants in times of thrift. Though he more than compensated those who were generous to him in these lean years, when he became wealthy in later times. In Auxonne, Napoleon, like all French men and women, was doubtlessly gripped by the news of events in Versailles and Paris over the summer and autumn of 1789. He greeted the revolution with considerable optimism, primarily owing to his anti-monarchical views and the belief that the changing political situation might benefit him and his family financially. Nevertheless, as a French military officer, he was forced in the summer to oversee the quelling of riots in eastern France. While he kept his political views largely to himself within an officer establishment, which largely favored the monarchy in the early months of the unrest. In August 1789, he obtained a fresh period of leave and headed back to Corsica, where he found that several of his siblings were also early supporters of the revolutionary movement, particularly his older brother Joseph and next youngest brother Lucien. In the weeks that followed, Napoleon established himself as one of the most vocal and prominent supporters of the revolutionary cause on the island, and particularly so in his native Ajaxio, urging others to fly the new tricolor flag which had been adopted by the National Assembly at Versailles as the new emblem of the country over the old gold and blue fleur-de-lis flag of the French monarchy. Napoleon was central to French victory at Toulon. A high promontory stands over the town of Toulon, and it was here in the autumn of 1793 that the Royalists and British had established one of their key defensive sites at Fort Mulgrave. From early on in the siege, Napoleon argued that if the fort could be seized and with it control of the promontory, the French artillery could then be stationed there and cannon shot would rain down on the British fleet in the harbour of Toulon, while the French would also be able to secure Cairo Hill cutting off the Royalist and British supply lines between the distinct inner and outer harbours of Toulon. On the other hand, securing the promontory would be a difficult task, given the paltry state of the revolutionary forces at Toulon, many of whom were under-trained, under-supplied and led by ineffective commanders. Chief amongst them was General Carteau, although he was replaced by the more capable Jacques-François de Gommier during the course of the siege. To offset these deficiencies, Napoleon began energetically requisitioning gunpowder and artillery from revolutionary forces all over southern France and having them brought to Toulon, along with other vital supplies such as sandbags. He even wrote to the government in Paris, petitioning them for further aid in his task. It all paid off. By early November, Bonaparte had an artillery reserve of over 100 cannon and was in a position to initiate a sustained barrage of the English position on the promontory with a view to seizing Fort Mulgrave. The attacks on Fort Mulgrave and a number of other smaller redoubts on the promontory, which the British had christened Little Gibraltar, continued through November and into December 1793. During this period, Napoleon showed great courage on the field of battle. In the midst of an assault on one of the smaller forts near Fort Mulgrave, a British soldier ran a pike into Napoleon's left thigh, leaving him with a wound which was severe enough that years later he claimed that his leg very nearly had to be amputated. On another occasion, he began loading a cannon himself, using a blood-soaked ramrod when the gunner who had been tasked with doing so was killed. The incident may have been responsible for Napoleon developing a viral infection of some kind, one which many have claimed was a form of scabies that he carried for several years thereafter. In the end, Napoleon's skin condition and severe leg wound were worth it. His plan to break the siege of Toulon by capturing Little Gibraltar had worked. Additional batteries of artillery, one named Jacobin, after the political clubs which Napoleon clearly felt a strong affinity for by 1793, were placed at two strategic locations on the 20th and 28th of November. As the artillery positions expanded, the British and Neapolitans attempted a sortie against Napoleon's lines in mid-December. But these were repelled, 
and late on the night of the 16th of December, a full assault, supported by de Gommier's troops, was initiated against the British position on Little Gibraltar. Under cover of darkness, the French assaulted Fort Mulgrave and after heavy close quarters combat, they secured it before dawn on the 17th. Napoleon's horse was shot from under him during the clash. But with the capture of the fort and the hill, the success of his strategy was realized. As dawn broke on the 17th, the revolutionary forces began moving cannon into place to lay fire on the Royalist, British, Spanish, and other Allied ships and positions below. When they began assailing the harbor, two Spanish ships carrying large gunpowder consignments were hit, creating an explosion which ripped through the fleet in the harbor below. With little Gibraltar lost to the French, their fleet badly damaged from the explosions and the position of the town utterly precarious now, the British, Spanish and other ships and forces began to withdraw from Toulon and negotiations were initiated to bring about the surrender of the town, which duly followed on the 19th of December, 1793. Writing concerning his role in the New Republic's victory, the Commander-in-Chief of the siege, General Dugomier, stated, I have no words to describe Bonaparte's merit, much technical skill, an equal degree of intelligence and too much gallantry.